Hello everyone and welcome back to Sonic Unleashed for Shamar's Werehog levels. The first Shamar level is a little bit different in that there are many back alleys and different uh, pathways to take that ultimately lead to dead ends but may have collectibles like Dark Force or more rings. This brings to mind something about the Werehog stages that although they're clearly different from the day stages on a fundamental level because they're beat-em-ups, they also have completely different design principles. For example, in the day stages in this game, there are multiple pathways, all of them valid ways to get to the finish line, but that most certainly isn't the case with the Werehog stages, which are strictly linear. The Werehog stages also don't derive their satisfaction from rhythmic action. The satisfaction in the day stages and in the speed stages in most Sonic games comes from how you chain actions and attacks together in a quick fashion. The same kind of satisfaction you get from playing a Tony Hawk game, really. Although the mechanics are fundamentally different between Tony Hawk and Sonic speed stages, the design principle is still there. The idea that the best way to satisfy the player is to give them opportunities to chain several actions together quickly to a stylish result. Now granted, the rhythmic action is less pronounced in Unleashed Day stages than it is in other Sonic games, but it's still undeniably there. It was at the core of 3D Sonic games starting back in the original Sonic Adventure, but it gained more prominence in Sonic Heroes and became the main focus of the modern 3D Sonic games. The Sonic games have always had different ideas of how to obtain rhythmic action, for example, the answer in Sonic Heroes was not just with quick platforming, but with quick combat. The combat being rather divisive, of course, but it was an attempt. Sonic 06 seemed like a combination of Sonic Heroes and Sonic Adventure 2's sensibilities on rhythmic action. It's a shame it turned out the way it did. And eventually, with Unleashed Collars and Sonic Generations, they just settled on fast-paced platforming as the source for rhythmic action. That seems to be the best received approach so far. 
Granted, Sonic Colors and The Lost World do seem to put more emphasis on the platforming than the speed. But the idea here is that rhythmic action has been an essential part of 3D Sonic game design since the start, and it's only become more pronounced over the years. I bring this up not just because it's really important to me, which it is, but also because the Werehog stages are entirely lacking in rhythmic action. Now this isn't unusual for Sonic games, for example, Sonic Adventure 2 has many stages that are also lacking in rhythmic action, in the form of the treasure hunts with Rouge and Knuckles. But those derive satisfaction instead from exploration. And before, uh, before you think I forgot, the shooting stages with Eggman and Tails, those do have rhythmic action. They're just much slower than the speed stages. So now that we've identified the Werehog stages don't intend to satisfy the player the same way as the day stages, and we look at the treasure hunting stages to see how those still tried to satisfy the player in a different fashion, we can assume that Sonic Unleashed's Werehog stages are still trying to satisfy the player, but in a way that may not be anticipated. And the most obvious sensible answer I could come up with is the satisfaction that comes from quickly destroying multiple enemies, similar to Dynasty Warriors, hitting them all in one big combo. And I will be the first to admit that hit sounds are satisfying and seeing a bunch of health bars go down simultaneously is, uh, is enjoyable. But it doesn't go far enough with the concept. The different attacks in Dynasty Warriors and the variety of playable characters and how quickly you destroy thousands of enemies forms a kind of addicting satisfaction. In this game, the quickest and easiest way to destroy a bunch of enemies is just by mashing the square button. The extra combos, when they do infrequently appear, often make things worse for the player instead of more fun. And I am giving the Werehog stages the benefit of the doubt by assuming the satisfaction is meant to come from dispatching multiple enemies quickly and in large numbers. Because if the satisfaction is instead intended to come from the traditional beat-em-up standby of solving all the different enemy types like puzzles, then this game has failed spectacularly at that. Even the strongest enemies are painfully mindless to fight because there's no punishment for fucking up. And even if one of the stronger enemies does actually manage to defeat you, you will be revived on the spot. I believe we already discussed this, but that even further removes the game from any sense of challenge it could possibly have. So again, I am giving the game a massive benefit of the doubt by assuming the satisfaction is meant to come from destroying multiple enemies quickly. And I do want to stress, as I do sometimes, that this doesn't mean I have no faith in Demps as a developer. Their work on the day stages is proof that they understand design and are capable of making something truly creative and impressive. But for some reason, things just didn't work out here. Anyway, the timing didn't quite work out how I wanted, but uh, there's another new big enemy that's about to appear, and I believe he's a good example of what I meant. I can't even remember what this enemy's attacks are, for example. Because whenever I see one, my brain just goes, oh yeah, quickly, mash the square button and he'll go down in a few seconds. That guy was supposed to be tough. Granted, we did have the Unleashed Gauge activated at the time, but that only saved us around 5 to 10 seconds. So you may be thinking, sure, you know a lot about the 3D Sonic games and their rhythmic action you love so much, but what about the 2D Sonic games? Well, uh, for the most part, I consider them pretty normal, average 2D platformers. Keep in mind I have not played Sonic Mania. But the traditional classic Sonic games, Sonic 1-3 and Sonic and & Knuckles, I just consider those really normal 2D platformers. I have played them all and they, there's nothing too outstanding about any of them if we're being honest. 
And keep in mind, just because I think they're all fairly average 2D platformers, that doesn't mean they're average in the same way or have the same game design sensibilities. The games are all very different and have different focuses. Sonic 2 is nothing like Sonic 3, for example. And I haven't played the Sonic Advance series either, but Sonic Rush is a good example of rhythmic action being incorporated into a 2D Sonic game, especially Sonic Rush Adventure. Yes, that game was so fast that it forced you to redo the levels and memorize them if you wanted to do well, but that's not really all that different from Sonic Generations and Unleashed, is it? And I do believe that Sonic Colors got a DS port that was very similar to Sonic Rush in terms of mechanics. I can't comment on how it turned out in the end because I haven't played that either, but I did look it up and it looks very similar mechanically. So if you're looking for that good old rhythmic action, but instead in a 2D format, there's always a Sonic Rush series and maybe Sonic Colors. Here's a new wizard enemy. This guy's on fire. In order to make him vulnerable, we have to hit him with a water barrel. That way we can actually start hitting him. If we hit him while he's on fire, he will hurt us. Okay, that's one new enemy type explained in like five seconds. Real heavy stuff, you know. Gotta think real hard to solve that guy. So in terms of 2D Sonic games, you have the classically inspired games Sonic 1 through Sonic CD. Then you have Sonic Advance, Sonic Rush, and uh, a couple of 2D games inspired by Colors and Unleashed that don't quite fit perfectly with the other games. And if you're curious what I mean about Sonic Unleashed having a, a 2D counterpart, then rest assured I'm not going crazy. Sonic Unleashed got a phone game for the Blackberry and it looks really bad. But it is a 2D Sonic game. So we've covered all the basics, right? And uh, come to the conclusion that aside from a few blank spots like Sonic Advance, Sonic Rush is the place to go for rhythmic action in 2D Sonic titles. But actually, we're overlooking something, something that a lot of people overlook because they tended to see it as a throwaway title. But it was a throwaway title that Sega briefly took very seriously, got its own sequel, and has, uh, vocal tracks. That's how you know your Sonic game has made it to the big times, if Sega thinks it's worth putting a vocal track in there. All jokes aside, I am referring to the PSP exclusive game Sonic Rivals. Opinions and critical reception of Sonic Rivals range from mediocre to, oh god, it's terrible. But I'm of the belief that it's a decent game that gets a lot right in the rhythmic action department and has a lot of cute ideas that help, its for that help it form its own identity. First, let's start out with the similarities between Sonic Rivals and the 3D Sonic games. Sonic Rivals fosters a similar sense of rhythm to the 3D games by letting you complete multiple actions very quickly, at high speed. The tools used to complete these actions are a bit different, for example the homing attack is no longer the main method to chain moves together, but the idea is still there. Another uh, similarity is that the stages focus heavily on memorization to optimize your route through, Multiple pathways are always something that's important to me in 3D Sonic games. I think they matter a lot, and Sonic Rivals has a lot, a lot of alternate pathways. In fact, I would say that's the main point of the game, is to explore the alternate pathways. When you find the quickest path through a level, the end result can look something like poetry in motion. But bear in mind that I mean what I say about memorization. If you want to get to the rhythmic action in Sonic Rivals, you have to be comfortable with memorizing entire levels. They're short levels, of course. And the necessity of memorizing levels isn't just because it makes things look stylish and makes you feel good, but because it's the easiest way to actually win the game. So a few things may have popped to mind uh, during that last statement of mine. You might be thinking, what, are there so many enemies and so many hazards that you have to memorize the whole thing, or you plummet into a spike wall like Sonic Rush? And not quite. How do you like that, huh? Ow! 
But we'll come back to Sonic Rivals' main source of difficulty later. For now, there are a couple more nuances about the platforming system I would like to explain. I've already stressed that the game places heavy focus on finding the best path to use and exploring multiple pathways. But almost equally important is how you reach those different pathways. And Sonic Rivals has an interesting answer to that. Sonic Rivals incorporates what I could only call some kind of leapfrog platforming system. You will come at many hurdles in the road, and you will have to choose whether to boost yourself forward with the circle button, or boost yourself vertically with the X button. And this immensely changes which path you take through the level. This is also the game's main source of rhythm, because you encounter these hurdles so quickly that you have to choose instantaneously which route you want to take, otherwise you'll pass by the hurdle entirely, and you'll be left in the dust. Sometimes the game will provide suggestions for you as to which route you should take, but you always have a choice whether to go vertically or horizontally. These suggestions appear less and less as the game goes on, necessitating the memorization of the levels and the hurdles they contain. But now we've come back to the memorization, and with it, why Sonic, uh, Sonic Rivals is actually difficult. Why there's a need to memorize the levels, instead of it just being something you could do if you wanted to look good. And the answer to that question is the same reason why this game is so divisive. Why Sonic Rivals is so divisive, rather, is that it is a racing game. A racing platformer. You are racing with a rival throughout the entire game. There is not a single level where you do not have someone trying to beat you to the goal. And your rival has all the same abilities as you do, move pretty much exactly the same speed, and only differ in their signature move. And this is the main reason that memorizing the levels is so important. Not because you want that S rank, not because there's a time limit on the level or anything like that, but because memorizing an optimal route through the level is the best and easiest way to get ahead of your rival. Some routes have better power-ups than others, some are just plain faster, and some have less enemies to get in your way. Basically, it pays to play smarter, uh, most of the time. Taking the fastest path through a level and placing your item strategically will give you an advantage generally, but keep in mind the AI is capable of exactly the same thing as you are. This means they can sometimes follow your path exactly because they're not human, and it doesn't matter how well you memorize the level, the computer already knows where everything is. Thankfully, for the most part, the game is good at avoiding this, and if you try and take the best or most skilled path through a level, the AI will have trouble following you. It's just that sometimes it doesn't. And I have mentioned power-ups and items a few times at this point. You might have some ideas of how those works, and yes, I can confirm that your greatest fears are realized, and they are pretty much just Mario Kart items. You can throw them ahead of you to slow down your rival, or you can drop them behind you to, uh, slow down your rival. But unlike Mario Kart and Sonic Rivals, it is even easier to dick over your rival with item placement, and the game actively encourages it. This is a platformer racer, after all, so placing items in just the right spot, or throwing items at just the right time, can send your rival plummeting into a pit. This is immensely satisfying when you do it to the computer rival, and uh, immensely frustrating when it happens to you. The rival mechanics can also be at odds with the game's general scoring system and its rhythmic action. For example, I said when you completely memorize a level, the result can be poetry in motion. But the rival is also trying to enact poetry in motion, and sometimes your poetry slam into each other and it doesn't sound as good as it would have independently. What I'm saying is that it's really easy to be doing a spectacular job and then get dicked over at the last second. How do you like that, huh? I hope you guys appreciate this. I hope you appreciate me putting an entire game analysis video in the Sonic Unleashed video again. Just to entertain you. You know, I could have made that Sonic Rivals video its own thing easily, but I'm doing this for you. I'm, su I'm suffering for your benefit. 
But don't worry, just because we're done talking about Sonic Rivals, that doesn't mean we're out of things to talk about. We're gonna talk about Sonic Unleashed Story for a bit. Sonic Unleashed Story isn't very good. It is way too full up on cliches and not enough interesting character moments to make it worthwhile. By the way, uh, I already opened the exit to this room. But there are a few other doors that I could open with additional enemies and we're gonna fight those. But as I was saying, Sonic Unleashed Story is way too full of cliches. And often the best part of Sonic stories and what makes up for the uh, overall lackluster narratives in the games are the character interactions, which are even worse in this game than the narrative. Chip is possibly the single least interesting character in the history of Sonic video games. And most of the character interaction seems to want to focus on Sonic and Chip's relationship, which is non-existent. We're supposed to believe they're friends, but they don't really do anything that friends do. They just talk about how much they're friends, which is not how being a friend works. And I'm not suggesting we see them hanging out and eating dumplings and talking about food and their favorite uh, movies and shit, because there are extra scenes that do that in Sonic Unleashed in the 7th Gen version. I'm talking about self-sacrifice. Chip doesn't really sacrifice anything or add anything to the adventure or help Sonic in any meaningful fashion. He just comes with Sonic and his chest closed when it's time to put the Chaos Emerald away. The game tries to remedy this toward the very end when it realizes that Chip has to self-sacrifice at least a little bit for him to add something to the relationship, but uh, it's incredibly ineffective. You can't make Sonic hold up the entire relationship until the very end of the game and then suddenly change Chip's personality so that way now he has something he wants to sacrifice. I feel like the relationship dynamic between Sonic and Chip could have been a lot more interesting if they weren't so goddamn obsessed with the incredibly uninteresting plot twist near the end that we have yet to see. And it's not like they forgot how to write characters entirely because Sonic's dialogue is fine for the most part. He's still the same person he was in the previous games, and even his responses that seem non-committal or unimportant are energetic or optimistic. There are a lot of little touches that really matter in how you write a character. For example, when Sonic learned that he had to literally put the entire world back together, his response was, Sounds like a great excuse to see the world. That matters. Stuff like that counts. When confronted with the overwhelming responsibility of fixing the entire world and saving it from destruction, he's just like, Alright, that sounds pretty cool. They even bring up later, uh, the core behind Sonic's character, that he just does whatever he feels is best all the time. He's not a very introspective person. He doesn't slow down or stop to think, he just does what he thinks is best. Acts immediately on his gut instincts. And that's very apparent in this game. So his character is written incredibly consistently. It has depth, there's things to enjoy here, you can see Sonic as a character. Now describe Chip's character to me. Tell me what is interesting about Chip, uh, how he lives his life, what his philosophy is. I'm waiting, just tell me, uh, tell me who Chip is as a person. I'll give you infinite time. Okay, so no pressure, but you want to see what I've come up with so far? I've written it down, it's a lot. I'll, uh, I'll let you see it now, it's too much for me to say. But here, here's what I've come up with, here's what I think Chip's personality is. So yeah, the core character dynamic in the game between Chip and Sonic, it's no good. It's no good at all. And seeing Sonic act like Sonic again is not a good enough reason to justify this entire narrative. But there are some other things I like about it. There's a consistent theme in Eggman's short-sightedness and hubris getting him into trouble. He actually would have won this time, he would have beaten Sonic forever, if he had just planned things out better. There's also a nice bit of world-building with Dark Gaia being too heavy to sustain its own form. Like, it's easy enough to say, oh, you awakened it too early, but they actually gave a reason. He's too heavy to sustain himself, if he doesn't, uh, if he doesn't get all his rest. But overall, it's really disappointing how, uh, how underwhelming and pretty, uh, pretty bad, honestly, the story in Sonic Unleashed is. Because the stories are actually some of my favorite things about most of the 3D Sonic games. 
Anyway, the idea behind this puzzle, if you want to call it that, is that fire is bad. So in order to get through the fire, we have to put a steel box on top of it to stop it. Surprisingly enough, this does come up one more time. This isn't just a throwaway mechanic, they use it at least once more. You know guys, I did it. I stayed on point the entire video, the entire, uh... The entire 20 minutes of Werehog stage is in this video. I managed to only talk about Sonic and Sonic game design, and even Sonic Unleashed itself at the beginning and end. I feel very proud of myself. Not everyone can do that, you know? Not everyone can talk about narrative themes and game design over a really boring video game for 20 minutes. Some of them devolve into talking about shit like a Cosmic Race on the PS1, and how it led you to finding out about Bug Racer and uh, Space Winder, also on the PS1. And you're like, how many weird-ass racing games on the PS1 could there possibly be? But no, I didn't do that. Also, it was Bug Riders, by the way, not Bug Racers. And even though it came out in 1997, it has nothing to do with the McDonald's toy line, also called Bug Riders, in 1997. So this big guy we're fighting, he's exactly like the other big guy, except this big guy has more health and he hits harder. And I mean, yeah, we're taking a lot of damage, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. How do you like that? 